Everyone who studied relativity is familiar with the twin paradox, the setup of two siblings who travel separate paths across space and time and, when reunited, are found to be different ages. They're probably also familiar with the conventional solution to the paradox, in which the acceleration of the traveling twin is given to be the underlying catalyst of the twins' differing experiences. But it turns out this solution is only valid for a very specific case. That is, in the flat space-time of special relativity. Step into the world of curved space-time, however, and this conventional answer suddenly no longer applies. Indeed, in this strange warped reality, the twin paradox becomes, well, even more paradoxical. This is Dialect with The Twin Paradox in Curved Space-Time. For the last century or so, we've been told the key to resolving the twin paradox lies in the fact that, in order to remain younger than their sibling, one of the twins has to accelerate. But in 2009, two European physicists published a paper where they demonstrated that this isn't always the case. Entitled, Adding to the Paradox, the Accelerated Twin is Older, the paper presents a scenario where the twin who accelerates actually ages more than their sibling. The twist? This twin paradox takes place in curved space-time, as opposed to flat space-time. Now, the difference between flat space-time and curved space-time is the subject of many a thick textbook, but at the moment, all we really need to understand is that flat space-time models environments where gravity doesn't have a significant presence, while curved space-time models those where it does. And since the traditional twin paradox is formulated in the absence of gravitational considerations, this means it occurs in flat space-time. But what happens if we throw gravity into the mix? To answer this question, the authors of the 2009 paper devised a simple setup. One twin, let's call her Alice, sits at an unchanging position in space, while the other twin, we'll call him Bob, flies around in a circle, starting and ending at Alice's location. Now, in empty, flat space-time, this situation resembles the classic twin paradox scenario. One twin is at rest the entire time, so her clocks tick fastest, while the other twin travels away at a high velocity, so his clocks tick slower. And although each should see the other's clock ticking more slowly, the classical explanation also tells us that, because Bob has to accelerate and feel a force in order to fly around in a circle, he will also observe for Alice time contracting effects, which, in negating and opposing the time dilation effects, ultimately cause her clocks to speed up, leading them both to agree that she is the older twin. But rather than hang around in boring old flat space time, the authors take this setup and embed it in a curved space time with a Schwarzschild shield like metric. Or, in other words, they place a mass in the center of Bob's circular path. Now, because of the gravitational attraction from that mass, Bob can, just like a satellite above the Earth, maintain his circular path via orbital freefall. Meanwhile, Alice, in order to resist falling into the mass, has to constantly fire her rockets. The authors of this paper then ask, if we run this same scenario again, who will be the older twin? After churning through the math, they discover the result is that the orbiting twin, Bob, will be younger than his sibling. At first glance, this may not seem too surprising. After all, it's the same result as you would get in the flat space-time setup. But this answer comes despite the fact that the roles of who is accelerating and who isn't have been completely reversed. That is, in the flat space-time scenario, Bob has to accelerate to fly around in a circle while Alice remains at rest. Whereas in the curved space-time scenario, Bob doesn't have to accelerate at all, but can simply follow an inertial path through curved space-time, while Alice has to fire her rockets to remain in place. Think about it for a moment. This is actually a revolutionary result. It changes everything we thought we knew about the twin paradox. But to truly understand it, 
we need to take a few steps back. Let's start by taking a closer look at the traditional twin paradox. You probably know the typical story by now. One twin stays on Earth while the other blasts off into space before accelerating to turn back around and return home. Turns out, this setup is actually rather misleadingly formulated. Though simple and easy to follow, having one twin always accelerate while the other doesn't makes it appear as if acceleration is the defining distinction between the twins' experiences. But we can just as easily have the two twins blast apart in different directions, then have one twin fire their rockets to return home sooner than the other twin. In this setup, since both twins will at some point or another have fired their rockets, they both can claim to have inhabited non-inertial frames or accelerated during their journeys. Yet, when they are reunited, still, only one will be older. This should already indicate to us that acceleration cannot be the only decisive factor in resolving the paradox. Indeed, in a case such as this, the determining factor becomes not who did or didn't accelerate on their journey, but rather who accelerated or turned around earlier. That is, if say Alice is the one who turns around first, then upon reunion with her brother, she will be the older one, because her planes of simultaneity will skip over less time than Bob's. Indeed, the sooner Alice turns around in her journey, the older she will become with respect to Bob. Notice, of course, that we can recover the traditional twin paradox in the limiting case, where Alice turns around instantaneously, or, in other words, just stays put on Earth. Another way to look at this is, if we chart the twins' respective paths on a space-time diagram, the twin who travels the greater space-time distance is always the older one. As an aside here, it's important to note that because of the negative sign in the flat space-time metric, shorter distances in space-time correspond to longer distances on a space-time diagram. Yes, we know it's confusing. Thus, remaining the younger twin requires not merely accelerating, but also traveling an overall shorter path through space-time. Now, in special relativity, these two phenomena are intrinsically linked, because accelerative motion always results in a shorter space-time path. Consequently, this means non-accelerating, or inertial motion, always establishes the longest possible path between any two events. But in general relativity, the correlation between such frameworks begins to shift. Because, as it turns out, inertial paths through space-time are no longer necessarily the longest. This is because general relativity takes a great conceptual leap forward with the idea of the inertial frame. In special relativity, inertial frames are defined wherever objects travel in straight, uniform lines with respect to one another. But in general relativity, inertial frames are recast as something else altogether. Frames where observers or objects are in gravitational freefall. Thus, in general relativity, anything that travels along a path influenced solely by gravity is in an inertial frame, whether that path is a straight line or not. A satellite orbiting the Earth, an apple falling to the ground, Susie rising and falling after bouncing off her trampoline, these are all examples of traveling in an inertial frame in general relativity. This shift in conceptualization came about because Einstein realized that there was no way to distinguish, at least locally, between being accelerated by a homogeneous gravitational field and being at rest. He deduced that this meant that gravitational acceleration wasn't real at all, but rather only an apparent form of acceleration. One which, like centrifugal acceleration or other fictitious accelerations, arises upon incorrectly judging the true motion of one's frame of reference. So although one can appear to be accelerating when they are falling towards the Earth or circling in orbit above it, they are not actually experiencing any force at all, but rather only traveling in uniform motion in inertial frames. These inertial frames are, however, subject to the curvature of space-time. And well, the trick behind curvature is that parallel lines don't have to stay parallel. Rather, they can eventually converge or diverge like lines of longitude on a globe. 
Likewise, for inertial frames at rest with respect to one another, their initial movements through time, or their world lines, start out parallel but can be made to converge if the dimension of time and space through which they move, i.e. space-time, curves in just the right way. This is, in a very brief nutshell, why inertial paths through space can appear to converge under tidal forces, or even circle back on themselves in orbital motion. This curvature is also why an inertial path through space-time might not necessarily be the longest one. The straightest path between two points on a globe, for instance, is not necessarily the shortest, since one can always take the long way around. Similarly, inertial paths through space-time, while being the straightest paths possible, don't have to be the longest. Now, let's go back to our twin paradox in curved space-time. In the scenario presented by the authors of the 2009 paper, the orbiting twin is subject only to the gravitational force, which again in general relativity means he is not accelerating at all, but rather traveling with uniform inertial motion through curved space-time. He never has to fire his rockets, and can therefore claim to be at rest the entire time. Meanwhile, the other twin, the stationary one, has to fire her rockets and accelerate the entire time in order to fight the curvature of space-time and remain a constant distance away from the central mass. She therefore feels a force or inhabits a non-inertial frame for the entire duration that her twin is in orbit. Now, according to the conventional explanation to the twin paradox, the twin who ages less should be the twin who accelerates or feels a force during the journey. Yet, in the scenario in curved space-time, this criteria completely fails us because the orbiting twin, despite never accelerating and never experiencing a force, still winds up traveling the shorter space-time path, and therefore comes back younger. Meanwhile, the twin who is constantly firing her rockets ends up older. What does this mean? Well, it demonstrates conclusively that acceleration does not resolve the twin paradox. This is a shocking result, namely because it means the explanations we've been given for the last hundred plus years have been definitively and undeniably wrong, or at least grossly incomplete. It also makes all the offshoot explanations, like the popular switching frames one, entirely irrelevant. This is validating news for the skeptics among us, who always found such solutions to be a little suspect in the first place. These solutions, after all, rely on the notion of absolute acceleration, a notion so poorly defined that even Einstein thought it was absurd. But if the conventional solution is wrong, just what then is the solution? This was the immediate problem that cropped up for the authors of the 2009 paper, and they attempted to resolve it by suggesting that the asymmetry of the twin paradox must instead stem from the differing velocities of the twins with respect to some globally defined standard of rest. That is, they said, the twin who travels fastest with respect to a global standard of rest will always end up younger, meaning velocity ultimately wins out over acceleration. But a number of papers published in response to the 2009 one quickly demonstrated that this new conclusion was itself equally flawed. By setting up a third twin paradox scenario, these other papers showed that, in the same Schwarzschild-like curved space-time setup, you can have a situation in which the twin who travels with a higher velocity actually ends up older. This new setup is almost simpler than the other two. Both twins begin at a point some distance away from a gravitational mass. And, as in the earlier scenario, one twin stays in place with respect to that mass, firing their rockets in order to do so. The second twin, however, is launched radially outward at a high velocity, then allowed to freefall in the mass's gravitational field until they rejoin their twin. This setup resembles the orbital setup in the fact that the twin who stays in place has to accelerate, while the twin who is traveling is in inertial freefall for the entire trip. Now, however, 
the outcome is reversed. The unaccelerated, free-falling twin is older upon the twins' reunion, while the accelerating twin is younger, showing that curved space-time can accommodate solutions in which the accelerating twin can be either younger or older. Meanwhile, based on these considerations, the papers conclude that velocity with respect to a global standard of rest can no more be responsible for the asymmetry of the paradox than can acceleration. Ultimately, these considerations suggest that there is but one and only one criteria for resolving the twin paradox, that of the lengths of the twins' respective space-time paths. That is, no matter whether space-time is curved or flat, the twin who travels the shorter space-time path will always come out younger. In flat space-time, a shorter path always requires an act of acceleration. But this fact does not generalize to curved space-time, where the shorter path can belong to the inertial twin. So what does this all mean for the twin paradox? In one fell swoop, we can cross three popular answers – acceleration, feeling force, and changing frames – off from our list of possible agents of asymmetry for the paradox. All of these have been routinely offered up as candidates in the past, and it's nice to know that we can conclusively move beyond them. But that still leaves the ultimate question of what really breaks the symmetry, what truly resolves the paradox. To begin answering this, we'll need to understand what actually goes into determining the length of a space-time path. But we'll have to dig into that later because this has been a lot to digest, and right now, our heads are spinning a little. But certainly, we won't stop exploring the mystery of the twin paradox in future videos. This has been Dialect. Thanks for watching.